This video lecture discusses groundwater basics and environmental applications. Support for the development of this lesson has been provided by the National Science Foundation through the Ohio University Board of Knowledge and the Science Classroom Program. This lecture is split into three parts. First, we will discuss basic groundwater concepts, including the hydrologic cycle, types of aquifers, discharge, and recharge. Next, we will cover groundwater contamination and end with some current applications. Have you ever thought about what happens to rainwater after it hits the ground? Sure, we see some water collecting in puddles, but what else happens? Some of the water trickles down into the ground, which is infiltration, and some of the water becomes runoff. Where does the water that infiltrates into the ground go? It becomes groundwater. Why is groundwater so important to us? Does anyone drink well water? Even if you drink municipal water, do you know the source of your drinking water? If your water comes from an open body of water like a river, do you think that it's connected in any way to groundwater? The answer is yes. Streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, the oceans, and groundwater are all connected to each other and rainwater through a process called the hydrologic cycle. The hydrologic cycle is a continuous process of water entering the atmosphere and returning to Earth's surface. Water enters the atmosphere through evaporation, evapotranspiration, or sublimation. Evaporation occurs when water in water bodies becomes a gas and enters the atmosphere. Evapotranspiration occurs when moisture from plant uptake enters the atmosphere. Sublimation occurs at extremely cold temperatures when water in solid form, like snow or ice, changes directly from solid to gas without entering the liquid phase. Once the water is in the atmosphere, it condensates, forming clouds that transport and store the water. The water then leaves the atmosphere through precipitation, either as rain or snow. The precipitation either becomes runoff, part of stream flow, or surface water storage, or infiltrates into the groundwater storage. Notice that the groundwater either discharges into the streams, ponds, and lakes, or the ocean. Then the cycle begins again. Groundwater is found in the cracks and spaces in soil, sand, and rock. But the term groundwater can only be applied to the water that is held below the water table. The water table is the top surface of the zone that is entirely saturated with water. In the saturated zone, all of the openings between the rocks and soil particles are filled with groundwater. The depth of the saturated zone depends on how many wells are pumping out water and the amount of precipitation. However, in the unsaturated zone, which is above the water table, some of the spaces between rocks and soil particles are filled with air. Water in the unsaturated zone is not considered groundwater. Groundwater is stored and transported through geologic formations known as aquifers. Does anyone know what an aquifer is? Aquifers are underground bodies of porous materials that store enough water to supply a well or spring. Not all aquifers are made up of the same materials. There are five different types of aquifer materials. Unconsolidated and semi-unconsolidated sand and gravel aquifers, sandstone aquifers, carbonate rock aquifers, interbedded sandstone and carbonate rock aquifers, and igneous and metamorphic rock aquifers. Regardless of the materials that make up the aquifer, all aquifers are classified as either confined or unconfined. Confined aquifers are located between two impermeable or confining layers, like clay or bedrock. Confining layers are sometimes referred to as aquitards. Because the aquifer is confined, it's under very high pressure, which causes artesian wells. Unconfined aquifers only have a single impermeable layer below and a permeable layer above. Most unconfined aquifers are sand and gravel with a layer of silt or shale above. Since the aquifer is unconfined, it is at a much lower pressure than the confined aquifer. The top surface of water in the unconfined aquifer is the water table. Take a few moments and try to label the two aquifers as either confined or unconfined based on the information given in the diagram.
The top layer coincides with the water table and has a clay layer beneath it. Therefore, it must be an unconfined aquifer. The second aquifer has a clay layer above and a layer of bedrock beneath it. We also notice that there is an artesian well coming from this layer, so this must be a confined aquifer. We already know that artesian wells occur as a result of a confined aquifer that is highly pressurized, but another condition must be satisfied. The elevation of the well must be lower than the elevation of the recharge area. Watch the video at the link provided to learn more about artesian wells. Let's define what is meant by a recharge area and discharge area. Recharge occurs when water is added to the aquifer. The area where this occurs is called the recharge zone. Discharge is the exact opposite of recharge. Water is removed from the aquifer. Discharge zones are often streams, lakes, and springs, to name a few. Notice in the diagram how the groundwater flow lines go from the recharge zone to the discharge zone. Streams are not always discharge zones. Sometimes water flows from the stream back into the groundwater, depending on the elevation of the water table with respect to the elevation of the stream. If the water table elevation is higher than the surface of the stream, it will be a gaining stream, which means the water flows from the saturated zone into the stream. Conversely, if the water table elevation is lower than the surface of the stream, it will be a losing stream because water will flow from the stream into the saturated zone. Finally, if the stream is disconnected from the saturated zone, it is called a disconnected losing stream because water is still flowing out of the stream and into a saturated zone, but it must travel through the unsaturated zone first. Follow this link to the DNR website for Ohio, which allows you to look up water well locations in your area. Unfortunately, groundwater is susceptible to contamination from a variety of sources. Can you think of some ways that groundwater might become contaminated? Contaminants might be fertilizers or organic waste from agricultural practices, oil or septic system leaks from residential areas, or chemicals and mine drainage from industrial processes. Many of the groundwater contaminants are non-aqueous phased liquids, which are solutions that don't mix well with water. NAPLs are classified as either dense, DNAPLs, or light, LNAPLs. DNAPLs are more dense than water, so they penetrate both the unsaturated and saturated zones and pool on an impervious surface. This pool creates a small dissolved plume within the top portion of the saturated zone. LNAPLs are less dense than water, so they collect on top of the water table and create a small dissolved plume within the unsaturated zone. When considering chemical contaminants, we look at the chemical fate and transport. Chemical fate describes the life cycle of a contaminant after its initial release into the environment. Chemical transport refers to the mechanisms that drive the movement of contaminants from one location to another. Transport can occur in three ways, advection, diffusion, or dispersion. In the event that groundwater becomes contaminated, there are four options for remediation, containment, removal, treatment, or lessening the effects. Contaminants can be contained using slurry walls, interlocking pipes, or hydrodynamic controls. The removal alternative requires pumping and treating. Contaminants can also be treated in the soil using potassium permanganate. Now that we've developed a basic understanding of groundwater and contaminants, let's consider some applications. We'll start with landfills. How do you think landfills might contribute to groundwater contamination? Take a few minutes to use this diagram and discuss with a partner how you think a landfill could contaminate groundwater. What happens to rainwater that falls on a landfill? Remember, we said that rainwater either ponds, infiltrates into the ground, or runs off, which is still true for landfills. 
But when the rainwater infiltrates in a landfill, it first percolates through all the waste material. As the rainwater travels through the waste, it picks up contaminants, which then pollute the groundwater. This contaminated rainwater is called leachate. Leachate must be collected and disposed of properly in order to protect groundwater near landfills. How much leachate does a landfill produce? Let's look at some nearby landfills. We'll focus on the Athens Hawking Reclamation Landfill. This landfill is located near Nelsonville, Ohio. As of 2008, the landfill holds 3.5 million tons of waste. It is capable of holding 14 million tons and is predicted to reach capacity in 2080. How much leachate do you think this landfill produces each week? This landfill produces 50,000 gallons of leachate per week. Every day, 10,000 gallons of leachate are removed. This seems like quite a lot of leachate to keep removing, so what might be a better way to remediate this problem? Mother Nature provides us with a solution for treating leachate in wetlands. These wetlands are engineered to retain the leachate long enough for the contaminants to be filtered out of the water. Besides just treating leachate, do you think there might be a way to prevent or reduce the production of leachate? Some might say that reducing the amount of waste that ends up in landfills will solve the problem. That means more recycling. But what happens during the recycling process? Is recycling really as green as we think? Discuss your ideas with the class. Then take about 10 minutes to research some facts about recycling and return to this discussion. Let's touch on a more recent and heavily debated topic that affects groundwater, hydraulic fracturing, or fracking as it's commonly called. First watch this video on fracking, then take some time to discuss how you think fracking will impact groundwater and whether the potential dangers of contamination are worth the benefits of obtaining the gas. For more practice with groundwater basics and contamination, you can complete the following activities that are included as part of this lesson.